Thank you very much. We're super thrilled to be here with all of you this morning on what here is a really, really lovely Friday morning. Congrats on making it through uh, the week. One more day to go until the weekend. Um, so as Kella mentioned, we're going to be talking about doing service design and mid-cultural plurality. And just to give you a bit of context for the morning, um, after a kind of brief uh, introduction and setting the scene, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Duan, who's going to draw from some stories from his interviews with service designers around the globe about how the narrative of service design needs to shift in order to more respectfully navigate within cultural plurality. And then we'll have a little bit of a discussion around that. We'll take a five minute break and then we'll come back and Shivani is going to share uh, her project work around preparing for the plural verse and really gets kind of hands-on into some uh, tools and approaches for how to um, build cultural humility um, as, as doing service design work. Then again, we'll have a, a short discussion and a wrap up at the end. If you do have any questions or comments, please add them into the chat and we may call on you if we have time, if you wanted to speak up about them or we can just kind of read them out and bring them forward. So please don't hesitate to um, add things in the chat as we go. So just to provide a little bit of context, um, here you can see our lovely profile pictures, which have been snapped uh, through Zoom. It's my new favorite thing to try and capture people being beautiful on Zoom through like sunshine. I think we need to appreciate uh, our digital spheres a little bit more. So um, Duan, Shivani and I are all, um, colleagues at the Oslo, uh, or at um, the, Os wow, I, <laughs> the design school, wow, I, I'm like totally mixing up, uh, Oslo School of Architecture and Design, there we go, I got it, um, and Duan is a PhD student, um, and he'll be sharing some from his PhD, Shivani is a design researcher, and I'm an associate professor of service design, and we all work together uh, on a project uh, and collaboration called the Center for Connected Care. Just to kind of set the scene and put things in context, I'm gonna share a little bit of a story from one of my first projects after um, going through design school to just set the scene of why cultural plurality uh, is so important to think about. So um, I was working on working in a design or in a consultancy and we were, um, asked to come onto a project that was led by seven First Nation communities in Ontario, in Northern Ontario in Canada. And these communities were struggling with the housing situation for their elders. So many of their elders um, ha had very poor housing. They were being forced to live kind of out of their communities in long-term care facilities that were quite um, mainstream. And just to provide a bit of context, in, in the Ontario context, many of these elders had been forced at a young age to move into residential schools that were intended to kind of socialize and uh, erode their, their kind of Indigenous culture and convert their, them toward kind of Euro-Christian culture. So these, these individuals had a history of being forced to live outside of their community. So the idea of having to move into long-term care facilities was almost a repeat of that sort of feeling again for them. So when we went into these communities, we heard things like, I'll stay here until I'm forced to move or long-term off long care off reserve is good, but they're not my people. And then a sense of like the community always took care of its elders, this feeling that there was a need to kind of continue with that tradition. So what did, what did we do? Um, as a designer, I, you know, used the, the tool set that I had learned and we did a whole bunch of interviews and we aggregated them into possible directions that these communities could go in to um, support this kind of housing issue. And then we went back to these um, communities um, with this sheet of paper and I did some dot democracy and I was aware of this kind of the difference in culture and 
tried to attend to that by, you know, bringing in some of the talking circles that were part of their traditions and doing this in a circle. But still, I kind of brought forward these uh, mainstream design tools, including dot democracy, where I got elders to kind of put stickers and dots onto these possible directions that were mostly reflective of what was considered progressive off reserve as well and in mainstream kind of communities. So just reflecting on this, it, it really shows how if you just reproduce kind of a dominant service design approach, this is the approach that I learned in school, it can contribute to eroding a local culture. So instead of really boosting up existing ways of designing, existing ways of working, the traditions of um, ways of dialoguing in a consensus-based model that the community had, I kind of brought in a bit naively this kind of tool set of service design and were, was showing how it could support in making this um, important, these important decisions. So I bring this not to be kind of flippant about the use of service design or to not be accountable to this. Actually, I think there, there is harm that can be done and we as a service design um, community need to better attend to our ways of working. So I would say that if we're not mindful, doing service design can cause harm amid this multiplicity of culture and that we need to get better in understanding the relationship between service design and culture amid plurality in order to better navigate. So that's what today is about. And I'm super excited to be joined by Duan and Shivani to be sharing some of this. Jonas, I'll ask you to turn on the poll if you can. And just as a warm up, what well, we are going to um, get you to answer this question. What do you think is the most important way that service design interacts with culture? Is it understanding it by doing ethnography or going out, you know, doing interviews and observations? Is it describing it? Is it about sharing insights or kind of relaying messages? Is it influencing it? you know, by developing interventions? Is it adapting to these, these, these existing cultures and situating itself in the process or is it something else? Just what your quick gut reactions are on that. We'll just take a minute. So it looks like most people's feeling, yeah, at least a third of people are feeling like adapting to it is one of the most critical things in that relationship, but also this understanding it and influencing it have big, big dynamics. Okay, thank you very much. We'll end that. Um, oh, I didn't share the results. So now you can see there's, yeah, some, most people felt like the most important is adapting to it, but we also have some of the others. So now I will turn it over with, on this note, um, to Duan to kind of unpack some of these um, different frames of how service design relates to culture. Thanks, Josina. I will share my screen. Here's my slides. Yeah, thanks everyone for the vote. And also thanks, Josina, for the facilitation. Hi, everyone. I'm Duan. Now, please, just please think about an experience that you have had with survey design and how might it be related to culture. And um, if you got a chance to share it, how would you narrate the story that you have? Please keep this memory in your mind and in this presentation that your memory will be an important reference to help to perceive the knowledge of survey design. Yes, uh, what I want to share is one of my studies with Josina and Simon Klatwosi. The initial topic of the study focused on how survey design as a kind of knowledge is related to culture. So we first propose a number of possible relationships, which as Josina mentioned, might be understanding culture, describing, influencing, and adapting theory design to culture. So this relationship emerges in the literature review. And based on these relationships, we interview the 21 theory designer from 14 countries in Asia, Europe, South America, and Australia to learn about their experience in the culture-related theory design. And those relationships gradually generated some questions to guide our interviews. And in this interview, we found that the relationship described can be easily related to the current dominant narrative 
absurd design that is often reflect in the faced, mod faced model of the third design process, including a dimension of the research phase and design phase where generation the knowledge, the generation of the third solutions often signify the end of the service phase and third design phase. And the linear story of the third design events emerges along this dominant paradigm. So moreover, they and I also share a very similar language system, such as user, problem, solution, and design methods with very similar value propositions, such as the user-centric or the human-centric. And also, they decorate their survey design in a very modern aesthetic style, regardless of the location. So in this presentation, I would like to share with you that how the the stories of the third designers that I talked to initially reflect the dominant view of the third design. And then I will discuss how this narrative needs to be disrupted when we explore the specific content of the designers. And in our interview, the richness of the practice of third designers went far beyond this dominant narrative. And we found more about designers' backgrounds on-site experience and the context. For example, designers may have had dinner with other participants, or they may have known each other before the practice, as well as some other informal activities. So these actions are not documented in the design process, but they exist. Comparing to the relationship that I present before, in this study, I present another four activities. It looks very symmetrical to the previous one, but I should note that this is to enhance understanding. It's not intended to build another dominant paradigm, but we hope to, in, in, we hope to illuminate what is often ignored in the theory design narratives. So first, in the research phase, designers can build the understanding of the culture through a set of given methods, such as interviews, Fox group and the designer, the, the designers tend to expect an objective position in understanding the culture. And here is the initial story of Anna, an Italian survey designer working in China, that she gave reflecting the dominant survey design paradigm. And in a project of tourism, she did a lot of interviews and observations and questionnaires to understand the culture of the tourism and the characteristics of the stakeholders in China. But when questioned further, Anna revealed some ignored aspects of her practice. And in her practice, all interviews are quest and the questionnaires were conducted in Chinese. And Anna needed to translate these materials into English with the translator but there was still a lot of things that she cannot interpret. It was not just in the design activities, but also in daily life. So she can only rely on her life experience in Italy to learn to capture some culture meanings. So understanding culture often implies that culture is something stable and preset, and we can just outline it objectively and however, we found that in many practice, the designers were interpreting the culture phenomenon they meet through the experience and the knowledge they have. Then after the research phase, there is a description of culture. Third so design can form a report or presentation to describe their understandings of culture and then defining the problems and the goals of third design. So here's the story of Amy. Amy presented her findings to the healthcare department management. And she did some storyboard-like drawings to illustrate how patients interact with different stakeholders, accompanied by some quotes that she collected in the field research. But, uh, she, shared, but then she shared some about her feelings. And in the presentation, Amy felt the tension between her and the staffs because she cannot anticipate their reaction to this storyboard. And she finds someone is surprised while some others are smiling. So in other other story of a German designer, Ella, who works in Japan, when she presented her findings in a stakeholders map, which is a quite common method in survey design, 
some stakeholders in Japan felt very angry because they felt that this method was totally wrong in this context. When more contexts are involved, we found that describing is also a response of the designer and the participants to their life and the backgrounds. Describing can always bring designers understanding to others. And when this, dis this description are presented to other participants, it help other participants to form a new awareness of their life. Then third designer aspire to influencing the culture, but most of them feel that influencing culture is a very distant goal for some third design project. And they think that influencing culture can need to be manifested through the well-implemented solution. And in Ian's story that she did a desktop tour for the Chinese community, but much to her regret, after delivering this tool to the community, they didn't use it. So for her, it is a very failed project. And yes, indeed, this tool is put on the shelf by the community workers, but some unexpected things happened. And the, the community workers were very prone to have a tool like this, and they were very happy to present it openly to others. Because of this, Yi Yun received an invitation from other communities to support them in doing community innovation. And we think that in the dominant knowledge, the, influencing of the, the influence of the designer is replaced by the influence of solution, a well-implemented solution. So the role of designers is removed. This story can provide the example that the designer can act a new imagination of service in letting other their desire to change the service and the current situation. And in the dominant survey design paradigm, it is perceived that there are some cultures that survey design can easily fit within. And there are some others that the survey design cannot will suit it, cannot will be suited. In many conditions, designers need to craft their methods to make the service approach useful. And I want to share a story of a failure, uh, which from the Claudia. Claudia and her team members prepare some materials in the UK, and they plan to run a workshop in the hospital of Uganda in the same way they did in UK. And unfortunately, no one in the hospital of Uganda want to attend. People refuse to express any opinion in this kind of workshop. And then they try to conduct one-on-one -on -one interviews but people still to refuse to talk. Then she shared more contextual efforts. She feels that it was necessary to understand the participants' deeper experience. So to doing so, she chose to take a more passive and a respectful approach by listening and talking informally rather than aggressively inquiring something in particular. She even had he had had have an argument with other team members in her team and they asked her to be more proactive and inquisitive. So there was some, and there was also a square for uh, of the Claudia story. The experience in Uganda influenced her very much. Afterwards, she left this company she was working for and she wondered what service design could be without a prescriptive pre-creative format. And with this in mind, she traveled to Nepal to have the local educational institution to form a fundraising strategy. She lived with the local community for several weeks and in daily routine together with others. And in such environment, she had plenty of time to communicate and debate with others. And she was always amazed about how people have different takes on what she thought was the same reality. So here, designers' design activities became intervened with daily life. And although she didn't build any design models, she was always able to capture the idea and the debate around them in daily dialogue. So regarding the adapting, we think the term adapting simplified the designer's efforts at the changing design methods. It implies that the third designer is trying to maintain the dominant knowledge in third design. But we realize that in the specific context, designer has emotion, feeling, bravery, compassion to pose them to the situated realities from the dominant knowledge. 
how we tell a story often depends on what we believe to be reality or realities and uh, often rely on the body of language we have. So one simple sentence from the from a book of the anthropologist Anna Lovenhout Chin might be helpful. So she mentioned that, no, you're not thinking, you're just being logic. Our knowledge gives us abilities to tell a story of our practice according to the logic of this knowledge. So cultural priorities matters as we need to perceive the sense that beyond the scope of our knowledge. So this sense have their way of being and existence and they might not be able to fully to be explained by theory design knowledge. So there are many different definitions of the cultural priorities, and I won't go into this too much detail today, but it includes, for example, the coexistence of the different individuals and groups, and the world views that accommodate difference in the, in the realities of the collectives. So, I draw an illustration here to be simplified that cultural priorities means that we might keep our tendencies to explain this world fully by the knowledge we have and take a look and listen to the people who are in front of you in the practice and the research. So more different worldviews as well as our own backgrounds can be seen or felt in this kind of process. Okay, thanks. And if you want to know more about these studies, please follow up our articles here as it is currently under review. Thank you. So, Josina, could you help with the discussion? Thank you very much, Duan. I think it's really important for us to hear these kind of um, narratives that show the different ways in which service design is being enacted that kind of stray from this dominant linear kind of model where we only have certain interpretations of our reaction of service design, like, you know, we can only be influencing things through the solution or what that might be. So now I'd like to open things up for discussion based on these kind of alternative narratives and challenging the dominant narrative based on um, through a lens of cultural plurality. So in the chat, I've just added a discussion question, but feel free to add any other questions yourself or um, uh, any things that you'd like to kind of follow up on. So the discussion question is, how might our narrative about service design need to change to more respectfully navigate a mid-cultural plurality? So if you have any thoughts on that, we'd love to hear. Um, feel free to add them into the chat or add your other questions. Stefan has asked the question, where did service design inherit the dominant paradigm? Duan, do you have any thoughts on how this kind of dominant paradigm got acquired? Yes, uh, I, I feel that uh, so the concept that we have is a very important approach and the tools that we use to analyze the other people and uh, to build our words because it's when we say a word, we are trying to name others through our language. For example, that when I say that the people in front of me is a user in my research or in my theory design, now he or she become a user. And in, in this way, we name it and we give them a concept. So to be sensitive to about the concept that we have and the language we use to describe, describe others is a way to to know, to perceive the dominant knowledge that we have, yeah. Thanks, Duan. I think that that idea of the concept help kind of aggregating some of this kind of cultural perspectives, this dominant cultural perspectives and the concepts we use in service design is very interesting. Shivani, I know you are not coming later, but I'm thinking a little bit about your design education in this uh, situation and whether you have any thoughts around how the dominant paradigm gets um, kind of replicated. Um, yeah, I, I did study, I did my bachelor in design in India, and I guess we had a way Bohos uh, design education. Um, but I also saw several attempts from like my professors to kind of bring in local culture and bring in a more nuanced understanding of how Indian society is. Um, but it, it has been kind of hard for me because I grew up in like the capital of India and kind of grew up in a very Western context. 
uh, everything in the West was much better. So I also like struggle a bit with uh, really knowing when it is the, what is the dominant paradigm and when I am replicating um, a more Eurocentric understanding of service design on, in a different context. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, also, you have a point about um, kind of the dominant paradigm. I don't know if you're willing to speak to that. Well, I have a point. I think it's part of the, the what in the Industrial Revolution became a pattern, paternalistic norm that we know better than the users. So it's, it's a tradition we are continuing if we are not aware of it and then try to, to stop it and listen to the users more and adopt to the, to the specific culture. Thank you. And Stefan, I see your comment here about like it not coming out of nowhere. I think that's something super important that this is also a construction based on power dynamics that you're getting at there uh, also as well. And I think that idea of how we define what service design is even, and I replicate this myself by saying, you know, service design began when Lynn Shostak wrote in 1982 that, you know, this is the service design blueprint and it's been around for 40 years. And so when we define it based on these very kind of Western dominant uh, understanding of it, then we are supporting that construction of the dominant paradigm and the kind of boundary setting of that being um, what service design is. Um, please go ahead. Yeah, you have your hand up. I'm not sure your name, but you can, you can add on here. I guess you're talking to me. Yes. What's your <laughs> name, please? Ron is my name <clears throat> from Ron. TC in Gothenburg, Sweden. Uh, I miss the definition of service in this presentation. If you if we don't understand what service is, then um, what are we <laughs> discussing actually? Because I'm I'm working at IT and uh, I'm very uh found of the the whole ITIL, ITIL, um uh, the idea of best practice. And um as you know, for instance, IT is a good example because when IT is relatively an a new technology <clears throat> and uh, many people, especially maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago, uh, they thought that if they know something about IT, then they are a big brain and nobody else would understand it. So, um, but now in the recent uh, years, we have turned IT to a service. So just like electricity, like uh, building uh, construction and everything else. Now, if uh, an organization want to provide a service then they should understand what service is. Yeah. And we should understand the usage and uh, the design and the difference of these two. Sometimes we design something without understanding the, uh, the usage in real, in real life. And that uh, wouldn't necessarily um, be the same as serving the community mm -hmm. or the people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's it, the question about understanding service is an interesting one. And I think it relates to what Duan was getting at around this notion of concepts and how our concept of service is actually influential. So a, a, a dominant definition of service at the moment is to use for actors to use their resources for the benefit of somebody else, their knowledge and skills for somebody else's benefit. But service is also a cultural concept. And I don't know, Duan, if you want to talk a little bit about from your perspective, kind of thoughts around um, service as a concept, and maybe even how you've seen that play out in some of your field research. Yes, definitely service is a very central concept that uh, server design knowledge hold and uh, aim to design or design for it. So, but, um, uh, but maybe I can share a little bit around my current field research in China that uh, I work here as a survey designer, which aims to build a service of remote care in the in the hospital. For me, this is a project of 
doing something for the service. But as I work with other doctors and the scientists and also and also the technical companies, and I realized that uh, not everyone rec recognized this kind of project as a service project. So for example, that uh, doctors here might have more ex feeling that this is uh, medical research that it, they can collect data and they can they need to to treat people or tr to create some some treatment plan for the patients here. So for them, this is not a whole service, but also a medical project and also related to their medicine knowledge. So regard, so here, service is not is not a concept that can be shared to all stakeholders in this kind of project. So so I feel that to to, uh, to better carefully to understand what is a service in the service design pro pro practice is a very important sense and and uh, it's always good that to 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 say that not everyone understand this sense as a service yeah thanks duong um, I think it is important to, and to understand that service is understood differently and that things aren't always seen as, as services uh, of as well in different countries. I, I think we might have to move on, but you can do, if you just have a super short statement. Right? No, I was Go just, uh, then, then I think uh, we should ch uh, choose another name to it. <laughs> then service design, you mean? Yeah. Uh, I think Stefan's kind of getting at that in the chat too. Maybe it should be design and uh, cultural plurality. Uh, thanks for bringing Thank that you. forward. Uh, Anuka, I think you're also getting at this idea of like maybe one way of this is more about a, creating a common learning process um, that I think is quite interesting. But David, I want to get at your question. So David is asking uh, how different is service design experienced when practicing it in different languages? For those who have practiced in different languages, do you experience the practice logic in different ways? I think that's a very interesting question because do on your quote showed this idea about kind of using logic but not really using thinking or or context i don't know a do on or shivani to start do you, either of you want to jump in on that does language i'm thinking yeah do on you're doing a lot oh shivani go ahead first yeah please I was uh, thinking about uh, sharing an example uh, from when I was working in India, we worked with this uh, nonprofit that wanted to bring in um, like this mobile app for low income communities to uh, increase literacy rates. So reading, there was some research done showing that reading helps increase literacy rates. And if we bring high quality literature to low income classes, they would, uh, they would, it would help them. And so when we started doing the research on feel, what turned out that reading, leisure reading as a concept didn't exist in like Hindi, the language that we were conducting the research in. And it turned out that uh, reading is uh, translates to studying, which like which means to gain knowledge in a like a professional setting or like a um, um, and that was something that we kind of brought up like you can't introduce the concept of leisure reading because we have an oral culture of storytelling in India. But since we had this client that was uh, based out of Europe and then we were doing the study in India, we kind of ran into this conflict where we did experience some tension, but I have to say we never addressed it more strongly and it was kind of left to that. So I have experienced some friction when it comes to language and concept. Mm. Thank you. Do you want any, you're doing a lot of translating between um, Mandarin and uh, and English and Norwegian in your current project work. Are you seeing language play out in service design shifting things? Yes, service design, the language play a very important role to separate service design culture, especially that um, in, at least in Chinese, that service is not a, not a old term that's from the Chinese language. It is borrowed from uh, I don't know, but but for sure that this is quite a new term that trans translated from others. For example, a term culture is um is a very new term actually in China that that happens in the last centuries. That um, term cultures in China means wenhua, but this kind of language is is translated from the Japanese 
while Japanese is translated to the English, and they borrowed its this kind of culture concept into the their local contexts. So, so language play a very central terms about translating knowledge because every term that we have is not a single term. They have so many related knowledge and history behind it. And uh, when we speak it out, that uh, we always borrow many other things that are collected with this kind of concept that we express it out. So be careful about the language and especially the translation is a very important thing. Thank you. Um, Akela, I see your comment and I, I'm really interested in this idea that you're getting at around the strong profession and becoming a strong profession. And I think so often, you know, designers are trying to get a seat at the table. Do you want to speak to this just briefly? I think that uh, the designers, the professionals are going stronger and stronger now. And I can see in some ways that uh, the design profession might be more important than uh, to see the, the big picture designers perspective is tending to to uh, to be a, a bit scary for the organization in some way that you, that mm -hmm. we are are actually uh, letting the those professions that are working now I'm thinking most about the, the, the economics in the organizations that are not involved in those processes there might be some fr friction between the designers as a profession and the, the, uh, the, other, the, other, the other kind of administration as a profession. Thank you. It, it becomes into somewhat of a cultural battle also when you're kind of putting up those professional boundaries. One of the things connected with professions Shivani and I have been talking a little bit about is this idea of the design discipline and even the word discipline being about, you know, like, setting boundaries, like you think about like whips and cages and things like it is, there's a, something about professionalism that's also boundarying and making very clear these concepts and who's in and who's out that I think is really interesting as well. Okay, next up, Shivani is going to share a project called Preparing for the Plural Verse. Uh, it's a bit more hands-on into kind of strategies for reflecting on kind of culture within the service design process. We've had so many great questions in the chat. We'll try and bring those into the next discussion, but keep them coming in. If we can't get to them all, we will respond to them after and include them on um, the Experio website when the, the post is made. But please, Shivani, take it away from here. Thank you, Justina. So open your eyes and soak in this beautiful, contradictory, imperfect world we live in. In our society, people carry strains of history, politics, economy, and we live within structures that shape our ideas of the world. We are emotional, interpret situations differently, and each of us has our own understanding of reality. All of us diverse people live in this beautiful mess, a society which we can call a pluriverse. In our pluriverse, cultures meet, change and borrow aspects of one another. These cultures can be experienced through an infinite number of facets, like ethnicity, social class, gender identity, and much more. Now, let's imagine your way of seeing the world, your lens to be like a kaleidoscope. Each facet carries traces of your rich background and experience, which influences the way you understand life, reality, and people. As a designer in this pluriverse, how does your lens influence the way you design for culturally diverse humans? Preparing for the pluriverse began as a six month explorative master's project where we look at culture through the lens of ethnicity. I'm Shivani and I work as a design researcher at the Oslo School of Architecture and Design. Uh, this project was done in collaboration with Uda Haye, who now works at a studio called LiveWork and my supervisor was Justina. The Norwegian society has always been multicultural. The Sami and the national minorities, such as the Romanis, Jews, and Quens, have lived in Norway for centuries, but have been oppressed by the dominant culture through forced assimilation politics, which was formally phased out in the 70s. The marginalization of the national minorities has led to a misconception that Norway once was a homogeneous society. 
However, today, the multicultural aspect of Norway is more apparent. Globalization and factors such as social security motivate humans to move, and this trend is expected to continue. In the last several years, the sociocultural climate has drastically changed. Discriminating practices that were once accepted are today seen as completely unacceptable. Critical incidents can further propel this momentum as we experienced it in 2017 with the Me Too movement. And about a year ago with how the Black Lives Matter grew in force after the murder of George Floyd, causing protests globally, including here in Scandinavia. And this has affected the public discourse where people speak up about marginalization and racism. For example, the COVID-19 lockdown exposed that minor minorities in Norway didn't have the same access to critical information as the majority, which was criticized by Lovlin Renna stating that the government has failed the minorities in the corona crisis. Several examples show that there is a need for greater cultural competence for designers working in the public sector. With the high rate of acceptance of service design in the public sector, designers have moved into positions of power, and there is the need of a culturally sensitive design practice. So we started out by checking the temperature, and we did this by conducting research into through and for design. For research into design, we have read literature on design practice. We touched on several topics like cultural sensitivity, biases, and power structures. We spoke to experts on feminist and decolonizing design and interviewed practicing designers from Oslo and Trondheim, two major cities in Norway. For research through design, we used giga mapping to explore relations and complexity. We explored ways to manifest theory into artifacts, which we then used to frame our generative sessions with designers. And then these sessions were systematically mapped out to understand if the artifacts worked. Alongside, we kept diaries to reflect around the situations we created. As for research for design, the output of this project is a tool developed for designers to use, and I will walk you through this tool later in the presentation. So from our research, we have three key observations that frame the project. We interviewed designers about factors that influence their ability to design inclusively. We learned that the designers have a general awareness about cultural differences, but it is often not integrated in practice, as one designer shared. I'm not saying designers haphazardly neglect to work more inclusively, but surely this is a situation all of us can easily find ourselves in. The next observation is the idea of starting with yourself. As one designer put it, we need to understand our own starting point before we try to understand the other. And the idea of starting with yourself connects well with the notion of cultural humility, which we found in our research. Cultural humility can be defined as the process of critical self-reflection that takes into consideration personal and systemic biases and how you view the world through your identity. During the interviews, we experienced that talking about cultural differences within design in Norway is taboo, as another designer shared. It's painful to raise this topic since people become defensive. It's painful that they're not curious or willing to receive the other perspective. We are on the grounds of a taboo conversation as this subject touches upon our biases, which are tightly connected with our self-image and identity. On the basis of these observations, we framed our research question to how might we pop the taboo bubble and create space to build cultural humility into service design practices? And having a conversation is a way to start. Welcome to Project Kaleidoscope. Come and explore your way of viewing the world and reflect how it might impact the way you approach your design practice. To explore the space, you will reflect along a conversation framework. A heads up, this reflection might get uncomfortable. Therefore, it is important to create a safe space with the frames of confidentiality, respect, and non-judgmentalism. You will start this reflective journey by jumping into a fictional design project and exploring your lens and biases. Then you will go through three exercises grounded in concrete design activities. And keep in mind, the point of this reflection is to explore tough questions and not to find the right answer. 
You will find the instructions and resources along the way. All you need is some paper and pen to get started. So find an hour's time, grab a close colleague or friend and start reflecting. So to recap again, Project Kaleidoscope aims to prepare designers for a rapidly changing universe. And it does so by offering a conversation framework. And this framework in turn forms a training ground for designers to build their critical self-reflective muscles. Uh, we have used some strategies to pop the taboo bubble and enable a concrete design discussion. I will go through some examples of these strategies. And just a heads up, I have blurred out the text in the examples to keep it simple. So the reflective framework is supported with written instructions and intentions uh, to ensure that participants know what to expect from the conversation. Artifacts that are typical for each stage to make the reflections more practice oriented. Critical annotations on these artifacts help prompt quicker and more focused reflections. And a comic is used to channel the voice of the user group and put forward a more nuanced perspective. There are cards to externalize different points of view to challenge the participants. Now we will zoom into the exercise of unpacking your lens. Imagine your lens to be like a kaleidoscope. Aspects of your identity and background form facets of your lens through which you see the world. Have you ever thought about how your identity and background influence the way you view the world? This is a lofty question, so I can share an example. In Norway, uh, I came to understand that people are expected to be neutral in a workplace, and one needs to leave their religion behind when they come to work. But my experience from India informs me differently. From my perspective, a person's name could be an indicator of one's religion. And this makes me question, how can an individual leave the religion behind in a setting and become neutral? And it is experiences like these that influence our lens on the world. But how do our lenses affect the way we view people? And this is an uncomfortable space in the conversation. We are all products of our time and our thoughts are shaped by the structures of society. These structures also inform our biases, which we all have, but they can be hard to acknowledge. Think of a ghost that whispers the biases in your ear. Are you ready to listen to these whispers? Have you ever caught yourself being biased in a situation? And this is hard to admit. And when we tested this exercise out, a design student shared, it hurts to find out these things about myself, but it's important to know in order to do something about it. A continuous unpacking of your lens and biases form the foundation of practicing cultural humility. In this framework, we take this understanding into different design stages to explore how they might influence your practice. So how could a conversation unfold using this framework? I, I will share a snippet of an aggregated conversation from our test sessions along with Josina, and it is about subjectivity and interviews. The participants have read the reflective question asking, how might you appropriately address the user's fear of being misinterpreted during the interview? They're familiar with the setting from the brief and have been introduced to the user's perspective. Uh, people might feel misunderstood when you don't hear them out. I agree, but how shall I start that conversation? I'd be nervous about how to phrase questions and not come across as offensive. Hmm. I, I agree. And this interview guide seems to be leading the conversation to be negative. Shall we let the user share their stories and then pick points to zoom in on? Sounds like an idea. But how can we know which points to zoom in on when we don't understand the context? This was a small example to show how a conversation could unfold. And this we constructed the, the snippet from different comments that came up during our testing sessions. To summarize, I took you through three points from the conversation framework, starting with defining our lens, unpacking biases, and then an example of a reflective dialogue around subjectivity in an interview setting. To wrap up, um, we see the mainstream discourse changing and people of privilege starting to acknowledge their part in propagating oppressive structures. 
And this first step of self-reflection is imperative for inclusions and designers are no exception. As shapers of an increasingly multicultural society, we need to pick up the lens towards ourselves and start nurturing a culturally humble practice. Today, a version of this framework is hosted on our website and the link will be shared in the chat. You feel free to get in touch with me if you'd like to talk more about it. And I hope you're inspired by the framework and can use it in your practice and maybe test it out with your colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shivani. Um, I think it's nice to have um, some concrete ideas around ways that we can build in this kind of cultural humility and critical reflection into our practice. So thank you very much for sharing that. Just in the discussion, I have added uh, the, the link to the website Shivani mentioned with, with the tools toolkit and some of the conversation framework. Um, but a discussion question for you, but feel free to add any others. What attempts at building cultural humility in your practice have you made, or do you think could be helpful for respectfully navigating amid cultural plurality? So if anybody has any reflections on that um, or other things, I'm actually thinking, Palm, if I was thinking that this relates a lot to some of your work that you're doing uh, in the hospital setting in uh, Stockholm. And I was wondering if you had any sparks of connections of things that you saw in common. So you're working not just with designers, but to try and um, work with healthcare providers more generally around their kind of biases and things like this. Did anything resonate from Shivani's presentation or things that you think are important in your work that you've seen. Sorry to put you on the spot. Ah, uh, no worries. Uh, but uh, yes, I was really happy to see this presentation. And uh, uh, so we, yeah, we at sort of Fukuset are working uh, with the healthcare staff, and we want to make them uh, maybe be more aware of the biases that they have, or the way that. Um, so the goal is to kind of maybe help them in the interaction with the. The patients that they meet but i think it's so important that you find the right way of approaching these kind of topics because it's so easy to um, start a conversation about biases and immediately that they shut the door so i think uh, what's what i like about how you explain the kaleidoscope is that you um, ask these kind of kind questions that are maybe more asking are would you like to know about your biases, because it's so important how you invite somebody to think about these aspects of themselves, instead of kind of forcing it on them that they are open to finding this out. Um, so I think a lot of our work has been to, first of all, try to understand this culture at a specific ward, and it takes so long time to understand, actually. Uh, so we are at the moment developing some kind of empathy gym. <laughs> Uh, so it's a bit of an idea uh, we're trying to have different exercises that can train your empathy so already for example in the word of saying empathy gym it seems like a gym you associate maybe with something that's healthy it's not that you are bad at something it's more about kind of improving something uh, so it's a lot about how we address these topics what words we use for them uh, to make people open to to change. So that's maybe a bit my thought that I can contribute with in this Thank conversation. Mm? Shivani, do you have any thoughts about that kind of invitation or that way of kind of creating space or an opening for a conversation? Yeah, I think that was one of our biggest challenges when we started interviewing designers because we went out and were like, oh, how do you deal with culture? Would you like to tell us? And mm -hmm. we were kind of met with this resistance, like, oh no, we, we include everyone. We have this, all these constraints about recruitment and the client tells us who we should be talking to. So I feel like we kind of went on this search for finding this metaphor and also finding the concept of cultural humility, which actually comes from healthcare um, mm -hmm. to open out the space. And as you say, ask the kind wide in question. And also in Scandinavia, it seemed like, yeah, it, there's this thought about uh, racism without racists uh, and it seemed like it's it's a topic that can't be just you can't just go at it and ask the question but you kind of have to frame the setting 
and through project kaleidoscope if you go through the prototype you will see how it, it sets up so you start with these ground rules to make sure everyone feels safe and inviting and you need to do it with somebody who you know who you've worked with for some time and feel comfortable in talking with and then you kind of create this fictional space that you enter so it's not attached with your real life project we give you a fictional space where you can have this conversation and kind of think about your biases um, and then you kind of take it into practice it, it, it was quite layered uh, to build up as you say it takes some time to arrive at the reflections thank you yeah i think that idea of quite intentionally crafting the space uh, is super important i'm thinking uh, I, Alberto El is also on this call. I'm thinking you're somebody who's very, very good at intentionally setting the scene for that. I'd love to hear your thoughts and reflections too, but I won't put you on the spot here. Um, there's a whole bunch of things on the in the chat about ways that people are working to kind of build this cultural humility into their practice. So, um, you know, writing diaries for themselves that reflect on um, their own bias. I think that's actually super interesting and critical to just have a practice of doing that. Value exercises, Osa is saying, kind of like standing on a certain line and then being challenged by a scenario or kind of prompting questions. There's scales of exploring different kind of bias. Um, I think, yeah, there's a few um, things online as well of like look to, to kind of practice with and um, reading a lot. I think that's, Shivani, you also mentioned that, that you kind of used um, critical, um, critical discourse to help understand some of these spaces and yeah, sketch diaries, those sorts of things. So I think um, those are all really interesting. Um, but I think as, as you're getting at, there is this kind of like struggle to kind of work through through the invitation and but these sorts of practices maybe kind of building them in might be able to be a way to kind of bridge across that tricky divide in this taboo space. I think one thing that I maybe forgot to mention was like uh, understanding defensiveness when you kind of meet find yourself in these situations where you're meeting a user who's who you're not familiar with or you're in a new context and you, you don't understand it fully. And you might like, when somebody points out something and you feel like you're feeling defensive, I think that was a good indicator, at least for me to start realizing that, ah, I am missing something from that other person's or the other context reality. And I need to do something to tap into it. Absolutely. I think, yeah, defensiveness as this signal and learning to understand our own bodies and our reactions as a way to do that. Shivani, there's a kind of comment in the chat here about this works with um, focusing on us as designers, which, you know, is an important starting place, but kind of as Palm's example was getting at, and you've been part of um, a, a course and, and teaching a course now where students were working to actually build cultural humility with others in a hospital setting as well. What do you, and do you have any reflections on that sort of context of not just kind of working with designers, but actually bringing this out into other spaces and any of the challenges or considerations within that? Um, I guess I could speak from one of the student projects where they were trying to um, uh, bring cultural humility into a ward. And I, I think one of the biggest uh, gains was like this shift from feeling like for the healthcare workers, just they felt like they have to learn everything about every culture and kind of know different cultures, which was like this heavy cognitive task on them. But when the students kind of brought in this idea of cultural humility and the healthcare workers like really was like, oh, I don't have to do this anymore. I can be self-reflective and kind of, continually gain an understanding. But what was interesting in that context was the, when it came to a conversation about implementation, the hospital hierarchy kind of stood out there. Like, oh, we need to get a buy-in from somebody on the top and somebody needs to put in money. And uh, then it was also this conversation around, oh, should we make this mandatory? Should all, everyone in our ward have to go through this? course that the students had developed around cultural humility but I guess one of the biggest constraints is like if you have closed arms if you're not open to having a conversation about it because it is a sensitive topic then it can't be like pushed onto you so 
uh, I, I think the students also kind of arrived at this realization of we need to build up the space from within, work more closely with the um, healthcare staff and also work across hierarchies. Thank you very much, Shwani. And I think, uh, Kirsten, you're, you're mentioning in, in the chat too that the value of kind of um, working with people of expertise in this area. So you're saying like strategists that have an ethics background, and in this case, Shivani also kind of partnering with um, the equality office in the hospital and things like that. So really um, leveraging and connecting as a way to bring this work forward and that it's not a task of designers alone. Um, but really tapping into that. So with that, I think we will um, close up here and I'll turn it over to Jonas. But before I do that, I just want to say thank you, Duan and Shivani, for sharing your research and your work with us and to all of you for these really thoughtful questions, sharing some of your practices. This is an amazing resource just in the chat here. So we'll be sure to any questions that we weren't able to get to, to kind of reflect on and include in the, the website and things like that. So thank you for your engagement in this Friday morning.